Yeah. So I was just talking, we we're just, we we're just talking everyone. Thanks for joining us. We we're just talking about how I was going back to my very first apartment and we had the above and the below washer and dryer combo. Good times. Good times. We just <laughs> come up randomly here. So yeah. Nice. How's it going, everyone? You guys, I am we so excited. For this episode. Do we have the chat view? I think this is the the most exciting episode for me uh, out of out of the nearly dozen that we've done so far. So, can you I'm just, just not contain that excitement? Just like, oh. <laughs> As All you're right. tuning in, everybody, go ahead and put in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. Yeah, so there we go. Literally around the world, where everybody's coming in from. Peru, oh wow, and Miami. Crazy time. Argentina, very nice. Houston, Texas can be fancy too. Yeah, I've been to Houston uh, when I was visiting. Netherlands. Gosh, what we did the, uh, geez, that's still I think where Shelly is. That's when we did that. She invited me out to Houston, uh, like- The now WordPress seems, thing, right? Yeah, now it seems like a decade ago, before COVID, pre-COVID. Right. We call that PC. So PC time. And I the first time I'd ever been to Houston, it was uh, very muggy. I liked it. It wasn't bad. And she took me to a cowboy bar and I had a drink that was the size of a, of a toilet bowl. And it was fantastic. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it tremendously. Oh, I don't want to drink anything that's related to a toilet bowl. Yeah, it, just the size. Right. It, was a, it was a lot of alcohol. Let's just say that. I, it was good. It it's good. It was a high a point. Size for you, though, Casey. You right, know? it is. You know, just, just, like just rats can't do it. Big. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I did get a. I celebrated my forty-fifth birthday uh, last. Gosh, Monday. Last <laughs> Monday. Oh, happy birthday! We're all gonna sing. Thank you very much. We're all gonna sing. I am forty-six. I, I can never remember. <laughs> and I got a lot of alcohol. And let me tell you, it was fantastic. I got alcohol that I usually am not able to buy myself. Uh, some very good people got me some very expensive scotch. I got a 25 bottle, 25 year old bottle of scotch. Very nice. Uh, it, it is exceptional. It, it's literally like, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm drinking ambrosia. That's how it is. So very nice. So another excuse for anyone on the call to come over because it is, it's exceptional. I, I highly recommend drinks that are 25 years old, you know, unless yeah. it's milk. Unless it's milk. Paula has a, a really good and important question. Did, did I get a candy corn cake? I did not get any candy corn. And I want you to know that I am I am I'm specifically upset with every one of you. Cool. You had an opportunity to send me candy corn bread, maybe some candy corn yeah. muffins, maybe something. I gotta and say though, it yeah. didn't even happen. Didn't candy even corn's happen. not in season right now. So I no, appreciate that our, oh, we're eating seasonally, Casey. No, no, it's in season. I found a five pound bag and I found just the pumpkins only, but it was going to take like two months to get to you, Casey. So <laughs> I, just, I, couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I was so I know, uh, Jim. Jim's on the call here. Uh, Jim from um, um, Amazing Ribs is on. He's, he's kidding me about a 46 year old bottle of whiskey. Let me tell you, I know that they exist. I have seen them on at Costco, but uh uh, you know, a twenty thousand dollars a bottle is probably a little bit too stiff for me. At least for now, it depends. You know, we'll wait. You know, we'll have to wait. Arson and Andrew need to get their commission checks higher, and then I know that I'll be able to afford that. That's the goal. Here. You're gonna have to do a few more audits, Casey. A few more, a few uh, more audits for that. Mm. That's funny. It's good times. All right. Well, let's get started. As everyone keeps rolling in, so today we are going to be talking about WordPress. Plugins. This is our 11th episode of SEO for Publishers with Casey Marquis, Arsene Rabinovich, and Andrew Wilder. So thank you everybody for tuning in. We're going to have Q&A at the end as always. So please feel free to drop any and all of your questions into the Q&A. You can do it all throughout the webinar. And then of course, once we open up to Q&A. If you see any question that's already in Q&A that you'd like to ask, there's an ability to upvote it and just kind of like a little thumbs up checker. So please do that because we definitely pay attention to that and make sure we address uh, questions that more than one of you have at a time since we can't always get to them. But don't worry, every single question that goes inside of the Q&A, we do get to in the recap. And it usually takes about a week and we uh, send out an email with a link to the recap. It's a blog post that has the, vi the video replay, the transcription, uh, resources, links to everything that was mentioned, and then all of the Q&A inside of there. 
So definitely head over to there um, to the Q&A box and put your questions in there. But without further ado, let's get started talking about plugins. Casey, what is the largest amount of plugins that you've seen on a single site? Oh, this is fantastic. I love this story. I get asked this question all the time. The answer is 117. Ooh, wow, that's and this was an e-commerce site. Yeah. <laughs> This was an e-commerce site. Uh, they had uh, Shopify. They had everything under the under the hood. Happened about three and a half years ago that I was brought in to consult on it. And I don't understand why no one else brought up, brought out, hey, is there a reason that we have four catching plugins installed? Is there a reason that we have, you know, basically uh, three image optimization plugins? Why do we have all this? It was, it was pretty hilarious. It's no one has come remotely close to that. I would say for a food blog, food lifestyle blog, 83. I think that's it. And Andrew's probably got me beat on there. I bet he's probably seen more than that, but I, 83 is recent. So that's. Yeah, good that's times. about the highest I've seen. Yeah. Good question times. is how many active at once and will this even load? I, when I say 83 plugins, I, I'm literally saying 83 active plugins. That's what I'm saying. But yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, inactive stuff, crazy time. Now, but again, you know, it's not like that this site was not performing well. This site that had the 117 plugins was a five and a half million session uh, a, a month site. A very, very popular site, a big well-known brand with e-commerce line. You can perform well, just not as well as if you had optimized that. Which brings me to my next question, Arson. <laughs> what are the benefits to plugins? Why do publishers need them? Optimizing, we're definitely gonna dive into much further, but there are yeah. a lot of benefits. Can you cover them, Arson? Right, well, plugins kind of help you expand uh, what your CMS can do, right? So uh, they can do everything from front end stuff like making your block look better to helping you manage stuff like redirects and looking for broken links. Um, so, you know, I have not seen, uh, at least recently, a website that was functioning without plugins, right? We all need at least like an SEO plugin because uh, WordPress out of the box does not support a lot of those functionalities. Um, but yeah, plugins do help. Uh, uh, they're important. Uh, uh, definitely use them. Uh, uh, just be careful which one you use. And I think we can just end the webinar at that, right? That, that's, that's right. That, that's it. <laughs> Thanks Call everyone for joining us today. Um, our next uh, podcast. <laughs> Casey, there, since there's so many plugins out there that do a lot of similar things, like you mentioned in your last question, how there was four caching plugins in there. How do you choose between the so many duplicate plugins that are out there and pick the best one to do a specific task? Like, What do you actually look for when you're trying to find and choose a plugin? That's a good question. I'm going to go ahead and paste over a resource from our own Andrew Wilder site. How to choose a plugin, very well known. Uh, it's great. I'm going to paste that over right now. I can take a look at that. And briefly, kind of when we're looking at a plugin, we're asking ourselves, is it supported? That's the most important thing. Is it supported? Has it been recently updated? Did it contain a lot of user reviews? I like to look at the change log. Uh, it, you know, and, and most importantly, I think a lot of the plugins that I've stumbled across have either been referrals from other professionals. Or it's something I've used myself. I've gone in, I've done the keyword search. I'm looking for specific functionality. Usually there's two, three, sometimes as many as six or seven options covering the same thing. And I'm comparing those plugins by bottom line um, reputation. Have they been updated? Are they going to work with the most recent version of Word, WordPress core? Uh, what are the comments on them? Is it actually, a, a do they have a support thread that's maintained? All of that will go into determining which plugins I keep. And like you said, a lot of the plugins, a lot of the catching plugins do the same thing. And then it comes down to personal preference in many cases. But that article that we've pasted over should provide a couple, little bit more guidance for anyone on the call who runs into the same situation. Right. And Andrew, how many plugins is too many to have on a publisher site in particular? And is it actually better to have a lower number of plugins? Like, is there a medium base when it comes to the plugins? What would you recommend? Uh, you know, I actually kind of want to fall back to my, my usual, like, you know how I usually say like, what's best for your visitor? Well, it's mm -hmm. kind of what's best for your site. Um, there is no magic number. So I know everybody likes to say how many plugins is too many. Okay, if you've got 117 plugins, you're probably too high. Even 80 is probably too high. Like there's a range. So like we'll see a range on 
um, on food blogs and publisher sites in particular, like 15 is on the low end and I'd say 35 to 40 is starting to get into the high end. Um, but the important thing to remember is the plugins are just more code. So a plugin can be three lines of code and that's it. It does one little function and that's it, right? And WordPress itself is made of hundreds of thousands of lines of code or maybe even in the millions. So not all plugins are equal, right? So you can't just say 80 plugins is bad and 15 plugins is good because it really depends on the individual plugins. Um, but in general, uh, you want to make sure you're being efficient and not duplicating code. So a lower number in general is better, but I'm not going to say like you have to have 15 plugins or fewer. Like that doesn't, that's just going to box you in unnecessarily. Like that's an artificial number for you because every site's a little different. Did you, yeah, I liked how, and I'm going to say exactly what, what Arson said was I like how Andrew avoided saying it depends. <laughs> but, uh, it's too early to start a, drinking we, right now. It's so. too, it, we're, we're having a drinking game where we have everyone who says it depends has to take a drink. Only I only have Canadian dry ginger ale today, so I'm good. Canadian, Canadian dry. Canada, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Canada. So circling back, Arson, when should you update a plugin? We kind of have an idea now of what's too much and a little bit of a bare minimum. But as Casey said, when you're scanning for plugins, you want to check and make sure that they've updated the plugin recently, that it's going to go well. Well, what if the plugin's already installed on your site and you get notifications saying it's time to update? Should you always just update when they say it's time to update? Right, so you know when you want to update your plugins immediately if if, if it's a security update, definitely right away. Uh, I've personally have seen a lot of sites uh, that let their plugins go and then get hacked, and uh, it just creates a bunch of issues. Uh, otherwise, I would say uh, it's best to wait at least a week to make sure nobody else is running into any issues when you're you know when the update comes out. Um, let them kind of figure it out for you. Uh, um, and then when updating a WordPress.org plugin, uh, it is also a good idea to look at the latest reviews as well as some of the support forums to see if anyone is having any problems. Uh, but definitely if it's a security update, you wanna get that done as soon as possible. Uh, but I'm also gonna say that I am not, uh, 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 plugin knowledge is not like my core. <laughs> uh, uh, so if Andrew or Casey wanna chime in on any of my recommendations, that'd be great too. Oh, we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was nice of you to extend that invitation, but I think it was already there. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> oh. Andrew, are there certain types of plugins that are more harmful to publisher and blogger sites in particular that say, um, like an e commerce site, it's great for them, but if a publisher put it on, it could be really harmful for them? I think it's interesting to that you're phrasing that as harmful. Um, plugins are not inherently good or bad. They're not <laughs> like, they're, so, you know, they're designed to help. Um, so it's, I guess, harmful if it's like doing something you don't need or want and you're dragging your site down. So um, some plugins, like I was saying earlier, are very lightweight and small. Some plugins are big and heavy, like WooCommerce. It's a great plugin. I use it to run my business, right? But it's a big plugin. And then you need a bunch of extensions to do credit card processing and to do other things, right? So I've got like five or six different WooCommerce plugins. So now I've added all this code and it's a huge plugin. So there's probably a few hundred thousand more lines of code on my server. Now I use like WooCommerce a lot, right? Like I run my whole business, all my billing, all of it through there, right? So it makes sense for me to use that. If I'm on a food blog and I want like a little affiliate section to showcase three products, WooCommerce is going to be overkill. And that's going to add a lot more weight and your server is going to have to do more processing. Um, can you do it? Yes. Uh, but you have to be careful of the unintended consequences. Um, one thing I do want to say, there is one situation where things can be very harmful. Um, are, well, actually two things. One is outdated plugins that have security issues, like Arson mentioned. So you do want to keep your plugins updated. Um, the other is if you try to cheap out and you're buying um, uh, plugins that are illegally being sold. Um, so because this is all open source, Somebody can buy the, the WP Rocket plugin, let's say, and then sell it on their own website cheaper, right? So you're getting a great deal. Instead of the $49 a year, you're paying $5 once or something like that, right? But the thing is, on most of the sites, they're injecting malicious code into that, and you have no way of knowing. So don't ever cheap out and pay for a plugin that's not from the original source. 
um, because that will, I guarantee, come back to bite you. Um, so if, yeah, if you see something that's, you think it's yeast, but it's really yeast. <laughs> plug I just want to let you guys know that the yeast plugin is not the same as the Yoast plugin. Okay, so be, be aware of that. We totally should have ended this webinar earlier when I said that thing. <laughs> Just be aware. But, I mean, Casey kind of brings up a good point. Andrew, how do you tell if if it could potentially be fake? Is it usually just like a name change or well, uh, the, these are these are like oh, sites so? these these are sites like selling the third party plugins. So they're not uh, cleaning okay. up theirs. They're saying like, hey, pay us ten dollars a month and you'll have access to hundreds of plugins and you can just download as many as you want or things like that. Um, they're they're basically like forked and hacked and like they're it may work, but it's a very big risk. Um, the other downside of that is uh, the people who are actually building the plugin and supporting the plugin and updating the plugin need to get paid for their work. So we have these plugins, right? So um, you're potentially hurting yourself and your site, and you're also hurting the, the entire WordPress ecosystem by supporting those sites. So if it looks too good to be true, it is. It's real simple, right? Um, but it, I, I don't think most people realize that those site, those plugins often contain malware also. So that's really the, the biggest pitfall right there. So I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that. I'm diving even deeper into this just because there, there's so much that can come from this, but say your publisher, you've already done that. You just, they just heard what you just said right now and they're gonna go and try and remove them. Is there a way to figure out if their site already has malware or, or even if it's shown no signs up to date, and this is the first time that they're hearing that they could have potentially done this, what would you recommend to kind of backpedal and obviously remove the plugin, but what can you do from there to make sure your site's okay? Um, yes, removing the plugin and replacing it with the legit version would be the first step. Um, make, making sure you have backups, of course, um, but then using a security scanner, um, you could use um, Securi's. Securi's got a little one that's free. I think it's sitecheck.securi.com or excuse me, security.net, I'll put the link in here. Um, so this is a quick a quick and dirty scanner. It scans the front end. Um, the security, security plugin also has a file integrity scanner that we use um, for all of our clients. Um, WordFence is also a good plugin. Um, so there's a number of security scanning plugins, but make sure you get those from a legitimate source. Like you can get it from the WordPress repository um, or WordFence Premium is a good choice too. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Casey, when should, other than obviously it being a third party and potentially giving malware to your site, when should you make the decision to pull the plug on a plugin and delete some of your existing ones? Say you have a lot of them. Other than quantity, when should you make that decision that, hey, I should probably go and clean up my plugins? I think we're going to cover how to perform a plugin audit later on and so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail then but one of the things i would recommend is installing a, a plugin called the query monitor i'm gonna go ahead and paste that over here for you today and the query monitor is pretty badass it's basically going to allow you to see if there are certain plugins on your site taking up all of your resources do you necessarily need that plugin at that time maybe we can deactivate the plugin until we actually need it maybe we just uninstall it and come back and install it again in the future if that would be more helpful. But the query monitor is a good way to see what is currently going on on your site and we can organize it by plugin. Uh, it's a pretty easy tool to use. I am certainly not technically um, and I, I do not have the level of technical aptitude that someone like Andrew has and I can do it without breaking my site, which is easy, you know, that's saying something. So again, it's idiot proof. It's very easy to use. Uh, so you can want to try that there. It'll help you. And then, you know, again, one of the other things that we want to do is that, you know, there are some plugins that we only need once, you know, might we want to, we install them, we use them, and then we get rid of them. Now there's uh, some plugins that we recommend all the time, uh, whether it's through myself, through NerdPress or through Top Hat Rank, there's plugins like the Broken Link Checker. Love the broken link checker and it works out. It works so much better now than it did a year ago. It used to be a year ago that you basically want to run that and then you basically run it once, correct it, then uninstall it or deactivate it. And nowadays it is so very low task, even when you check it with the query monitor, that you could literally leave it running the whole time and be okay. So it just determine it, things change. So you have to determine what you need when you need it and then make those decisions in real time. That makes sense. So it's a constant evaluation of your plugins. It's not, let's add a bunch and cross our fingers. 
question. Arson, are there any consequences to deleting plugins or things that can negatively happen to your site as you go through and start to clean up your plugins? That's definitely probably one of the biggest hesitations to starting to delete plugins is, oh no, now X, Y, and Z is gonna maybe happen to my site. Right, so I'm gonna be, I think the first one today to say it depends. Uh, uh, it depends on the plugin. Um, so if you're using a plugin that generates short codes, the short code will now be broken. And I see this a lot when, when I do my consults, uh, uh, I check some pages and I see like a weird short code that was left over from a previous theme or a plugin that's been deleted. And now it's a part of your H1 or it's between paragraphs and it just looks weird. Um, if you're using plugins that generate URLs, those URLs will most likely be 404 ing uh, Redirects generated by plugins such as Yoast Premium, uh, um, I think will be gone. Andrew, can you, can you chime in on that? Does Yoast just have its own tables or does it write to HD access? Oh, for the, re for the redirects? Yeah. Um, mo the default is its own redirect. So if, you, yeah, if you're using the Yoast Premium redirection tool and you get rid of Yoast Premium because you want to save some money and downgrade, you'll lose all those redirects. Um, right. So you have to transfer them to another tool or you know, take care of right. it. Sure. Those are done through the database. It's not like it writes to the HD access, right? It can, but it doesn't by default, yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then there's plugins again, like Yoast and Rank Math that like, uh, I think metadata will go away also if you if you delete it. So like whatever, if you're auto-generating titles and metas for, for like your categories, that stuff will be gone as well. Um, I think yeah, the that's, safest, go ahead. Yeah, just to, just to interject on there. Yeah, and this is very important guys. If you're using Yoast and you get, you know, like, hey, I'm gonna change over to Rank Math and you, you have to make sure that you convert all that information from one plug into the other, or you use something like, it's called the SEO, tra the Data Transporter, which is a well-known plugin that will allow you to move all the data from a theme over to whatever plugin you use. So make sure, maybe I can go ahead and paste in that, that plugin as well. But the Data Transporter has saved saved us on tons of projects where someone had, uh, they were using, for example, maybe the built-in Genesis information where they would just put the titles and descriptions in Genesis, but we could use the set, the data transport to move all of that over to say Yoast as an example, but you always want to be aware of that going forward. Right. And then what, what, what I would do, and this is what I would do, what was, would do back in the day, uh, um, and this, I would just delete plugins one by one to see if anything goes weird. Uh, and then if it does go weird, just, you know, bring the plugin back. Uh, um, just kind of like that kind of testing would, would let you know if, if you're going to mess anything up. If you're going to, if you're going to go that route though, um, be careful. Some plugins, uh, can delete their data when they get either deactivated or deleted. So oh, right. sometimes it, it depends on the plugin. Uh, most will, most are poorly coded. So they'll actually leave all their data behind. Um, <laughs> so over many years, your database gets gunked up with all that stuff. Um, but usually with most, they don't lose their data when you inactivate them. So deactivate them, leave them there, test. And then if all is well, you can fully delete it. So you don't jump straight to deleting it. You can inactivate it and it's still installed. Um, so that's that's one step in between that makes it a little bit easier to recover if, if you did break something that way. It's just easier to just don't break something, but that's not realistic. So how often should we audit, Andrew? How often should we go through and actually run a real plugin audit and decide which ones to keep, which ones to remove? And on top of that, what are the steps of doing an audit? Um, this makes me think of when uh, we were working with a trust attorney and we set up a trust and they said, you know what, every time you have a life-changing event, you should, you should revisit this, right? Like you wanna revisit your will when you get married, when you have a kid, when your kid goes off to college. Um, so I think life-changing events on your site is a really great time to do that. So you're doing um, a redesign, of course, right? You wanna make sure you do all that cleanup afterwards. So anything that isn't needed after the redesign. Um, but in general, I think it's good to review this every few months. Um, it also depends on if you're the kind of person who tinkers a lot, if you're like, I wanna chase the next best thing and you're constantly installing plugins, then you're gonna to need to like back up for a second and take right. a, a, a 30,000 foot view and say, okay, now when is the time to clean this up? Um, Cause some people will, you know, you don't need to necessarily change your plugins for years. You just keep them updated um, and that can be great. But if you're very active in chasing the next best thing which many of you probably are, um, you know, just be, so it really depends on you. So it depends. Um, but every few uh, months, I think it's a good idea to look up, look at the plugins and go through the list and say, hey, do I really need all of these anymore? 
Arson, how can you tell if a plugin is affecting your site speed? And are there specific plugins that are really large site speed killers, even if they're necessary for other things, but they it's just black and white. You can't get around it. It does affect your site speed. Right. So this was this was a super technical question for someone like me. So I asked Matt, who's our uh, uh, head of tech, a top head rank. He gave me some bullet points uh, and I'm going to read them off to you guys. Oh, PowerPoint uh, presentation? Uh, no, no PowerPoint this uh -huh. time or at all, uh, ever, please. Uh, uh, so the easiest ways to test uh, if, the plug, if the plugin is affecting your speed is by activating and deactivating it and checking the speed, obviously. Uh, uh, keep in mind network conditions between you and the website server uh, means that you'll never get the same results twice. Um, the best way to determine whether or not a plugin is having significant impact on your site speed is to test locally offline in an offline environment. Uh, plugin, plugins that generate log files should be properly configured to remove older logs. Log files can quickly balloon in size. Typically speaking, you only need two to four weeks of logging data. Uh, backup plugins should be configured to use remote storage or a limited number of backups should be kept. Uh, broken link checker is a powerful plugin but should not be left running continuously. And I think Casey mentioned that a few minutes ago. Uh, um, most related post plugins are very database intensive. Jetpack has a related post feature built in, which will offload the functionality onto their servers. Can I add one? Um, do, please, please. Um, I think in general, that's that's all good advice. I think broken link checker is not the resource hog it used to be. So um, no. yeah, that's why we're now recommending it's okay to leave it running. Um, you also want to make sure you're not on an underpowered server. Um, if you're on a $3 Bluehost server, you should probably keep that deactivated. Um, yeah. one, one plugin I'm going to call out by name, though, because I see it on a lot of publisher sites, is Thrive Leads. Wow. Yeah, it's a good one. Get rid of Thrive Leads. Can't stress that enough. Um, we also see problems with Bloom. Um, that one also log. Both of those log a lot of data, but Thrive really is not built for speed. Um, so anything made by Thrive. Uh, we just see a lot of speed issues. Supposedly, they're working on it. A couple of weeks ago, they had a blog post saying, hey, we're going to work on Core Web Vitals. And I'm like, mm. where were you guys a year ago? Yeah, no kidding. So <laughs> um, so I, I'm not afraid to call them out. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, the mailing software companies, you know, like MailChimp and ConvertKit and Flowdesk, they all give you code that you can put on your site for forms and pop and stuff. Most of those are not great for site speed. Um, so one of the things we recommend doing is um, using a plugin for pop-ups or opt-ins or lead gens um, that's built for speed um, and then linking that to whatever your mailing software is. So Convert Pro is a great one for that. Um, we've tested it for speed and it works really well. It does not drag down your site. And the nice thing is once you set that up, if you wanna, let's say you wanna move from MailChimp to ConvertKit, it integrates with both of those. So you can move and you don't have to change all your forms. You just reconfigure the plugin to say, hey, send all these signups into Convert kit now. So right. it, you're less locked in that way too, which makes life a lot easier. That makes sense. Is there, Andrew, a specific plugin that you'd recommend for image optimization? There sure is. No. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love short pixel. Um, we include that on our premium support plans. Um, in my tests, it has performed the best. Um, uh, their lossy, which is their standard, which is their strongest uh, setting, um, produce the smallest file sizes and the best image quality. Um, a very close second, though, is Imageify, uh, which is from the makers of WP Rocket. They're the same company. Um, Imageify does really well. I found their ultra setting, which is their strongest, tended, uh, at least yeah. last time I looked at this, it tended to hurt the image quality a little Too much. Um, and then their middle level doesn't compress as much. Aggressive. Um, yeah. Yeah. But Imageify isn't bad. It's just short pixel, I think is better in terms of the end result. Um, um, I would also say on the flip side, don't waste your time with Smush, um, especially the free version. It's practically useless. That's kind of, it'll save like 3% off your images. Um, and Smush Pro, if you actually use the Pro features may be okay, but you're gonna be much better off with short pixel. And Casey, what plugins Switching gears and talking about block editing now, what plugin should you use to expand the blocks in the block editor? And what do you do if you have blocks disappearing with 5.7? Ah, uh, that's a good one. Yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. So there's a lot of uh, ways you can ex extend your suite of blocks uh, with uh, the block editor. And the three of the best ones are Cadence Blocks, Atomic Blocks, and Guten B. And they're all three great. So it's really hard for me to say, hey, which one's better than another one? But you know, you know, take a look at them, see which ones you like. They have a lot of overlap. 
cadence block. So if you're, you know, especially if you're a recipe or a lifestyle blogger on the on the site and you want to expand kind of the just the visual appearance of your various blocks, maybe you want to have a better looking call to action block. Maybe you want to have a, a list block that you can play around with the colors a little bit more. This is how you do it. You can expand the existing functionality of your blocks and make them, you can just, you can pretty them up, so to speak. It's basically like the Ashley Segura blocks. And whereas like the regular, it's just Casey and Arson. If you want to have the Ashley Segura of, of pretty uh, butyrized blocks, Cadence, Atomic, and Guten B, you know, that's what you want to do. Uh, now, Ashley, also you mentioned something about the, the recent update there, which is having to do with uh, basically updating to 5.7. We had been getting a lot of complaints, and I know Arson can start, not Arson, definitely not Arson, but Andrew could speak to this a little bit more too. But what happened was that when we upgraded to 5.7, we had reusable blocks that would start to display empty on the front end. It would just show as a blank rectangle and there would, just, there would be a spinner, but nothing ever comes up. And so unfortunately we found that at least for now, the only way to fix this was to roll back the changes. And for those of you on the call who have experienced this, we recommend the WP downgrade plugin if you necessarily need to roll back 5.7 and this is one of the reasons why. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in here. And this is something to be aware of because I can't tell you how many blockers emailed me about how for all of a sudden their call to action blocks were not working. And we usually just had to roll them back or do a full backup. You know, and just important when you do a rollback here, you wanna make sure that you do a full backup mentally. You wanna set the version of the plugin settings to 5.6.4. And then you're going to click on the button, which is in the yellow box, which takes you to the updates page where you can do the rollback. So let me go ahead and just paste over that information here if necessary. But yeah, good times, 5.7. Not ready for prime time. Just to reiterate, that's, that's just on reusable blocks mm -hmm. if you're having a problem with them. Yeah. So if everything's working fine for you, you don't need to roll back, <laughs> but it's just this one instance. Uh, or, with, you know, if you just don't have anything else to do and you want to cause more work for NerdPress, that's fine. <laughs> Go ahead and roll all that back, send them over to them, say, hey, Casey told me to roll everything back and, you know, good times. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. No comment. Probably safer that way. But Andrew. Is it necessary to keep a backup plugin such as Updra Updraft Plus when a host such as Big Scoots keeps backups for you? There's a lot of big words there. Um, I love this question because the answer is heck yes. Um, I'm uh, a big, big fan of backups. Um, so a few years back, a friend of mine had her site hosted with a little outfit in Vegas, um, or they were based in Vegas. It wasn't Orange Geek, um, <clears throat> some other small shop. And she didn't have any of her own backups. And supposedly they were taking care of backups for her. Um, and one day she went to go to her site and it was gone. And the entire hosting company was gone. And their email addresses were bouncing. Her site was just gone. Now, Big Scoots is a much more reputable host. Um, so I don't think Big Scoots is going to disappear anytime soon, right? But um, she had no backups of her own, so she couldn't restore anything. So um, unless you have the backups or have access to the backups, right, you could get stuck someday. Um, now, Big Scoots is totally trustworthy. I trust that their backups are gonna be great, but they only do nightly snapshots. So you've got every night, there's a full server backup. And if you say, hey, Big Scoots, I need to roll back. They're gonna roll you back to whatever state your site was at the end of the day, the night before. Um, so you could lose whatever changes happened over the course of that day. So if you did a whole bunch of work or a lot of comments came in, uh, those could get lost. Um, so if you have your own backups, you know, let's, let's say you deleted a couple of images by accident. Um, you don't necessarily want to roll back to a full snapshot before you want to be able to go in get those few images and just restore those. So one of the things we do is have um, two different offsite backup systems because like, I want redundancy on my backups. Uh, like we have backups of backups. Um, and then we also do um, Updraft Plus for local backups. And those aren't for disaster recovery, but they're for convenience. And Arson's list from Matthew mentioned this before. Um, it's great to do some local server backups because they're really fast. You don't have to transfer them to a, a cloud storage. Um, but if your server goes down, those aren't useful, right? So we use those, um, like if we're updating plugins, we'll run a quick backup on there. So we can roll back if we need to very quickly rather than having to go to cloud storage. Um, so yes, uh, backups are like the most important thing because you can screw anything else up. And as long as you have backups, you can recover, right? Um, so don't 
don't just rely on your host. Make sure you have uh, trustworthy, usable backups. And backups are only as good as um, if you can restore them. So like, it doesn't help matter if you think you've got backups if they don't work, right? So it's good to make sure you really know what you're doing with backups and know how to restore them if need be. So yeah. did you already share your recommended backup plugin? Um, no, but I think was was Updraft mentioned already? Yeah, um, Updraft Plus, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so we, we use a few different tools, but Updraft Plus is one of them. They have a free version and a premium version. The free version does a great job. Uh, the premium just has a few more features and more flexibility. Um, but if you are if you want a free version, um, you can set that up to do backups like a Dropbox account or a Google Drive folder if you use Google Drive. Um, and then you can just have it do that. You wanna make sure though that you're, if, you're, if that's your own backup system and you're setting that up, you wanna make sure you're backing up everything. So all the files and the database. Um, and then depending on how update, how often you update your site, you might want to back up more frequently or less frequently. And is it kind of redundant to have two backup plugins? Um, no, it's, that's fine. I would say make sure they don't run at the same time. So if you can schedule them, you don't want them trying to do backups at the same time because that can overload your server. So like you could set one at midnight or one at uh, 6 p.m. or something. Um, the other advantage of that is then you, you're alternating snapshots. So if you need to roll back, you can pick one that's not as old. Um, so you get a little, a few more points in time. That's a good call. Now that we're getting a little bit more granular in specific kinds of plugins, Casey, are there any plugins from MediaVine Suite that you'd recommend using and maybe any that you would recommend do not use? I, I think MediaVine does a pretty good job. I know we get those questions a lot. They have Grow by, uh, you know, Grow by MediaVine, which used to be social, social pug. They've built on, they built a lot onto that. It's, it's good. I mean, that's one of the probably the most popular plugins now other than, you know, say, uh, what is that? Uh, Rocket, not WP Rocket, but what's that other one that we see a lot of? Rocket Boost. Social and, Rocket. Social Rocket. And, uh, you know, there's there's very, it's a small number of, of plugins now that really work that don't really hurt you for page speed and at least grow in that regard. It's pretty good. Now, I talk more about Andrew about this, but I mean, we do tend to, when we have conflicts, it does tend to be grow or create. We see that over and over again, and I'm really not sure why that happens. I think a lot of it is the fact that, you know, Mediavine tends to not necessarily worry about their plugins working with everything else. They worry about their plugins working with each other first and foremost. And sometimes that's a backward approach to take when you're pushing out updates at the rate they're pushing out updates on their plugins. But I would say Grow is fine in most cases for social sharing. You just really want to be careful about it. I would definitely not update the plugin and, uh, for oh, two weeks or so until we wait and see if there's any bugs. There usually are. And same way with Create. Create is a, is a very good plugin. I would say that it's great for roundups and how-tos. I personally do not feel that Create is remotely near the level of a WP recipe maker. So I don't recommend it for recipes. Uh, the thing about create is that you know you there's a lot of things in the plugin that you can't do that we can do with WP Recipe Maker. Uh, simple things like uh, checkable checklists, uh, linking all of the content in the recipe card to an actual author byline, making sure that we have a better looking nutrition label, or not even showing a nutrition label and just linearly showing that content. There's also just a lot more built-in functionality with WP Recipe Maker in the end, so I tend to to recommend that. And it, it, it's fine. I think that overall, I, I think you can get by, but as with anything, you, you'd want to test it at your end and, and see if that's, if you like the visual display and if that's something you want to go with. And you all mentioned Jetpack. I think all of you have at least mentioned it once. So Casey, how necessary would you say it is for bloggers to have? You know, Jetpack, Jetpack is kind of interesting. It, it gets a lot of hate in that, you know, everyone thinks, oh my God, it's, it's a plugin that does everything. It's, you know, we don't need it. It's so, it's so host heavy. It's so slow. None of that is ever really true because no one ever uses all the functions within Jetpack. You might be using two or three features at the most. I mean, some of the things that the plugin does, uh, you know, you have live uptime and downtime monitoring. A lot of bloggers love that. I mean, people sometimes will just install Jetpack just for the ability to track the ability, you know, their site being up and down and have it email you if there's any issues. It has the ability to do related posts. It has the ability to, it has built in lazy loading for images, free CDN. You can publish posts by an email or RSS feed. 
it has lots of options. And that's the thing is if you don't think that you're going to use a lot of those options, don't use Jetpack. I think where people get confused is they tend to install Jetpack and they forget they have Jetpack installed. And then they're not sure exactly what they're using Jetpack for. So we tend to want to, as we mentioned earlier, test. Maybe we turn off Jetpack just really quickly and see have we lost some functionality. Have that happen all the time in audits where people have Jetpack installed and I just ask them, do you know what you're using Jetpack for? And nine out of 10 times, they don't know. And so we'll quickly go through and we'll look at the plugin and see if there's anything in there that we could replace with an existing plugin that's already on the site or something that, um, you know, maybe they don't need the whole plugin to, to take advantage of that functionality. But I think inherently, not a bad plugin at all. Far from it. It's backed up by Automatic, which is one of the top names in the field, has very good support, and it doesn't it doesn't really cause a lot of problems. It's just that it is a big plugin if you're the more functionality you use. So as you're going through and doing your plugin audit in the next quarter, mm -hmm. that would definitely right. be one thing to analyze. Well, one thing I really like about Jetpack is their stats. Um, I install Jetpack on my sites primarily for that. I, mean, I turn most of the things off, but the stats is great because you get a quick overview of the number of pages per day. Per day. Um, and I love being able to cross-reference that with my Google Analytics stats. Um, I can't tell you how many times we get emails saying my Google Analytics like ha have tanked and it's actually a configuration error or right. Google Analytics itself is, is glitchy and not you know delaying and reporting. So having a second set of stats that you can cross-reference really makes a huge difference when troubleshooting. Um, if they're, yeah, and they won't, track, they won't track perfectly. No. Um, if they're within like 10% of each other, um, then you're probably in good shape, right? So it's, it's a nice way of verifying your traffic is actually what you think it is. Right, and Andrew, paid versus free plugins. This was a really popular question that we got um, from everyone who was registering. Which plugins would you say are worth paying for and which types of plugins can you get away with free versions? And I know that, that I just <laughs> fully set that up for an it's a pen <laughs> answer. But in general, if you're trying to, there's so many plugins out there. So in general, if you're trying to compare between free versus paid, when should you pull the trigger on paid? So how important is that plugin to you and your business, right? Um, if, if, you're, if your website is your livelihood, then why wouldn't you invest in the tools properly to, and to do that in a way to make sure that those tools are going to continue to work properly for your site, right? So one of the things I've started thinking about more and more is when, you, when you're purchasing a paid plugin, you're supporting the plugin developers, right? You're contributing to the ecosystem and you're helping that plugin stick around. So if like, there are a lot of plugins where I'll use the free version because that's plenty for my needs, but I'll actually purchase the premium version to help support that developers to make sure that they're going to keep building in new features. So um, not that we should be altruistic, like it's actually, I mean, that's good too, but it's self-serving too, right? Like I love WP Rocket. I want to make sure that WP Rocket is still going to be here in five years. And, and it's gonna be better and, and they're gonna keep investing in development. Uh, same with Yoast SEO, right? Um, uh, those are the bigger bigger shops. There are also lots of smaller shops too, right? Um, WP Recipe Maker is a good example, right? It's, it's basically a one-man shop, it's Brecht, right? So when you purchase that premium plugin and you're paying him your $49 a year or whatever, you're supporting him so that he can, he can continue to work on it and expand the plugin and he's, awesome at it, right? We report a problem, a week later, there's a release with a bug fix. And again, I can't, I cannot stress this enough. It's, we don't have an affiliate relationship with Brecht and WP Recipe Maker, uh, not at all. We have just been doing this a very, very long time. And WP Recipe Maker continues to kick the crap out of basically every other recipe plugin out there. And the only reason that not everyone's using WP Recipe Maker is just because they don't know, or they're, they're in a closed ad thrive or media vine group and they're, told something that's not necessarily full of factually correct. So just understand if you have to go with free, go with it. You can use the free version of WP Recipe Maker and it's fully compliant with Google structured data guidelines. You just can only use calories, but it's really worth it to upgrade and get just the incredible amount of customization and extra features that go into providing a really slick, clean, kick-ass recipe card that makes an impression. Yeah. And to, I think, I think, you know, to step back for a second, because I kind of went into the like support the developers answer. Um, you know, there's a logistic question, right? Of like, is, is, well, first of all, is there a free plugin? You know, a lot of plugins, they don't have a free version. There's only a premium version like WP Rocket. There is no free version. They, it's, there's two different business models, right? Um, the other is you create a free version. You get that in the official WordPress repository. 
you download the free version and then you say, oh, I like this free version, but I want more features. So then you purchase the premium version. So Yoast SEO is in that category. Uh, Updraft Plus is like that as well, right? So if the free version works for you and you don't need any other features, then great. Um, especially on a larger plugin, I think that's fine. On the smaller ones, um, like there's um, another guy, Jordy, um, from Meow Apps. Uh, he creates uh, a number of really great plugins. Um, one of them is Media Cleaner Pro. Like I was working on cleaning up media images from a client site and I could have installed the free version, but I just went ahead and um, paid for the premium version. His support was mind blowing. He actually added some custom code to fix one of the problems we had. So like you're paying for support too. So that's another reason. Like on the free version, the only support you're gonna get is limited on the, in the forums. But if you're paying for a premium version, you're really, what you're really paying for is support, not the code technically. Um, so if you, if you need a lot of support, that's another good reason to pay for the premium. All right, so that's a good way to analyze whether or not you're gonna need to free your free or premium. Freemium? Yep. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. It only takes one. Arson, <laughs> as a new blogger, what must have plugins would you recommend if you're just starting out as a blogger? What's your lineup? Right. Uh, so definitely Yoast. Uh, Yoast SEO for uh, starters. Um, WP Rocket for caching. Um, Short, you want some kind of like image compression, short pixel, uh, uh, uh re smoosh it, Andrew. Yeah, you still like those? Not re smoosh it, okay. Short Don't do re smoosh it, yeah, okay. Uh, um, Updraft Plus for backups, uh, WP Optimize for database optimization, uh, Google Tag Manager, uh, for WordPress, obviously, uh, Recipe Card for everyone who's uh, obviously a recipe publisher, uh, WP Recipe Maker. Uh, and then WordFence or iTeam security uh, for security, unless Andrew says otherwise. Those are perfectly fine plugins. Perfectly fine, perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. We agree with your recommendations. Thank you, thank you, well, sirs. Well done. You may continue. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> These are the answers you're looking for. <laughs> Casey, what are, regardless of if you're just starting out or if you've been a blogger for years now, what are your must have plugins, especially since you've audited, audited? Yeah. Audited, audited, audited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've seen it all. I, you could say it. Yeah, I've definitely seen it all. It's, it's been a good time um, from 117 plugins to sites only had 11. Yeah, it can, wow. it can, it can be done. What's, uh, your you know, what's that? What's your list then? What's your go-to? Well, you know, everything that, that Arson said here, fantastic. I would only add to that. I would say that for database management, I recommend Optimize Database uh, after deleting revisions. It's a fantastic plugin. Uh, for backups, he said Updraft Plus, uh, Security. Uh, Security, I guess I see a lot of. I, I think Andrew might be talking a little bit about that. I know I see that a lot, quite a bit with Security, Security. We've talked about recipe plugins, WP Recipe Maker, Yoast for SEO. Uh, Site-wide changes, there's a search regex plugin, a regex plugin that is uh, very good, especially if you have to change out all of your short codes, which I see a lot. That's a great utility plugin. I'm also going to go ahead and paste over limit modified date, which we've shared repeatedly, and we can talk a little bit about that. I'm going to paste those over right here. But the... The regex plugin is again uh, very popular because uh, if you change email embeds or if you have some kind of a broken code and we need to get all that broken code off of your site, we can do a site-wide change and, and remove it that way. The other option is limit modified data and limit modified data is just a, it's really a handy utility plugin. It's what it does is it allows you to go into a post and not update the last modified schema in the post, which also doesn't update the sitemap, which is a signal to Google and others that we haven't been in the post necessarily. Now, Google can always do whatever they want to do. They could come back and visit the post five minutes after you were in it. But at least by using this limit modified date plugin, you can go in and make small changes, not have to worry about needlessly updating the last modified date, which Google and users tend to find very helpful. And we would like to have that at the top of the post. It's just a utility plugin that we tend to recommend. Um, but yeah, very little things like that. I think Search Regex is a perfect example of a plugin you want to use once 
you use it as the tool to do the find and replace. And then, and then you delete, delete it. it. Um, yeah. I see a lot of like WordPress importer plugins or widget importer you know, stuff like if you're tra transferring from one theme to another and you have a tool to export import. Um, but once you're done with that, you can get rid of that plugin. So go back to our plugin audit conversation. Andrew, what's your list? Um, I think you all hit all of them, except um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Amy Katz in the chat. She called out the Feast plugin, and that's a great one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally forgot so, about that. If you're running any sort of a, even if you're on a Genesis theme, that yeah, you're not yeah. running a Feast child theme, it will work. Yeah, it just it will not work perfectly. Uh, so Skylar um, has been doing a great job staying staying up to date with like best practices and like he'll ping us and be like, hey, what's the latest thing? And we'll tell him. And then like a day later, the plugin Boom. has a feature Updated. to deal with it. Um, yeah. So um, if you're using their themes and the Feast plugin, uh, that's a great tool for staying on top of things. Um, so I just wanted to give that a shout out as well. Um, and uh, you know, there was the question for new bloggers. I'd also recommend um, Food Blogger Pro as a resource. It's not a plugin, but they have a lot of great training, um, videos, and forums for help too. So if you're if you're very new to food blogging, especially, then Food Blogger Pro is a fantastic place to go. You know, also just very quickly here, and I, I think we're gonna are we talking about plugin audit, or we get to that already? We did cover that already, but if you have anything to add. Yeah, one of the things that we want to do, especially for those of you who are going to be doing a plugin audit, one of the things you really have to do is avoid conflicts with your ad provider. And Mediavine and AdThrive both have a lot of conflicts. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to paste over their help pages, which is something you should use when you're doing a plugin audit to make sure that there's no conflicts if you're running any of these ad networks specifically. So take a look at those help pages when you can. Uh, I would have pasted over, I think WP Engine has a list, but you know, frankly, I don't like their list. Their list has a lot of plugins in there that shouldn't have any conflicts, period. So I don't tend to publicize their list and I don't necessarily think that uh, you probably need to be using WP Engine if if they're having problems with the, with the amount of plugins on their list. So just be aware of that, but I know a lot of you on the call are already qualified for an ad agency. Those two resources will help uh, help you considerably as you do your own plugin audit. So thank you for adding that, Casey, to the audit. And that wraps up all the questions that we had. So we are opening up Q&A now. Uh, there's 26 questions so far. So go wow. and set the Q&A. Upvote. You can click the little thumbs up thing that's in there if there's a question in there that you have the same question as well. Otherwise, throw in a question in there. Um, we definitely will not have time to answer all 26 today, but we will be addressing every single question that's in there. So if you have a question, put it in there. But for now, let's start with this question and opening it up to any three of you that know the answer to this. This is from an anonymous attendee. Is there any way to see which plugins can be removed without breaking the site? I have ones like list category posts and scalable vector graphics and don't know if I need them or not. Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was, I was trying to multitask. I was answering Amanda's question, and, I, and then I totally failed. What's the question again? <laughs> no problem. Um, is there any way to see which plugins can be removed without breaking the site? I have ones like list category posts and scalable vector graphics, and don't know if I need them. So you have to figure out if you're using them is the trick. So list category posts is a fantastic plugin. It lets you add a short code on a page that will then generate a list of posts in a category. Um, so if you, you might be using it in something like a recipe index. Um, so if you think, you know, if you're not the one who set it up, you're going to have to talk to your developer or do some research and poke around on your site and try to figure out if it's working. Um, the other way you can do it is deactivate the plugin and see what breaks. Um, if you're going to go that route, you might want to do that on a staging site first. So like if you're hosted with Big Scoots, you can just click create a staging site, log in over there, you deactivate the plugin there, and then find out what breaks. Um, so uh, the SVG thing, the scalable, scalable vac vector graphics, I'm going to guess your theme designer installed that and is using it for something, so you may need it. Um, it depends if you're using SVG graphics for maybe like your header or some images in your sidebar. Um, so it's, it's real hard to give a generic answer to that because you have to really kind of find out, are you using this or not? And then if you are using it, do you want to keep using it? Or do you want to stop using whatever that feature is, change that out, and then you can get rid of the plugin? Makes sense. Um, we have a lot of people who have upvoted this question. Thoughts on Slickstream? How do you guys feel about Slickstream? Good. 
Yeah, I think it's fine. We've, uh, we've, Andrew and I myself have both had calls with uh, the main principals behind them. We kind of know them well, and they've done a very good job with it. And uh, yeah, it's not for everyone. I, I got to say they're very open to feedback. I remember when we first had the call with them, I said, guys got to make this thing cheaper. <laughs> and that's what they did. They lowered the price so that they could get more people into this plugin because it was just, it didn't make sense for these smaller bloggers to, to sign up for this when they didn't have the money or the income to support it. And they've done that. And I, a lot of people just like Slickstream for the fact that they have a really cool intuitive search function, which takes over the site and, you know, the favorites and the recommendations engine is also very good. But a lot of that is also having to do with bringing back some of your cookie list data that you can use. And I know that they're working on making that a serious contender to some of the options provided by the ad company. So it's certainly something to consider. We, we do recommend Slickstream. I don't, might not be ever for everyone. And it's certainly, I would be remiss if I said, I thought that it had really any big SEO component to it. I know that they'll say, you know, maybe this will increase your time on site and maybe it'll help you, you know, increase a little bit more of your cross-linking. But honestly, I wouldn't hitch your wagon to those claims. I would just use it because it's a nice functionality that users tend to like when they're on your site. And like, Andrew always says, think about the users when evaluating if something is good or bad for the site. Yeah. All right, next question. We have time for a couple more. Is there a plugin to remove Amazon affiliate links in all published blog posts easily without having to do it manually? Do you guys know of any plugin that does that? Well, I tell you, and maybe Andrew knows, does that the RegEx plugin allow you to do that at all? Can you go in and remove all the affiliate links that way? The only other option I can think of is the blog fixer. The blog fixer provides an actual fix that will go in and do all this for you. I'll go ahead and paste it over here for you. Remove Amazon affiliate links fix. I think the tricky thing with the Amazon affiliate links is they can take different forms. Right. So you can have the Amazon amzn.to, like their short link. You could have an iframe. You could. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you've been really consistent with using the same format of link every time, like throughout eternity, whenever you started, then it's probably pretty easy to do a search and replace. But if, you're, if you've been inserting it with different formats, it's going to be harder, unfortunately, to pin down. Um, and I definitely go to Chris's service. Uh, go to yeah. blog we're, we're all about working smarter, not harder. So if you can afford the 50 or 60 bucks, it's one of the best things you'll ever do. I know Chris has a wide range of features. I recommend them in all my audits. Um, they're, they're very good. And more than that, he's really quick about, hey, is this something that you think will have value for the niche? And if we don't think so, then he doesn't do it. So that's pretty nice. So yeah, and that way, if you want to automate it, definitely look at Chris for that fix. I also want to mention, since we've talked about Broken Link Checker, um, Broken Link Checker will flag Amazon links as being um, broken uh, because the Amazon firewall blocks the test, not because yeah. the link is broken. And yeah. then the trick is by default, Broken Link Checker will actually put a, a strike through any broken links on the front end for your visitors. So if you're not careful, you can end up marking all of your affiliate links as broken, which will make people not want to click on them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go on the settings of Broken Link Checker, you can turn off that feature to mark uh, strike through uh, broken links. And you can also, if it's flagged in an uh, Amazon link, um, you can just mark it as not broken as well. Um, so that's like the one gotcha on broken link checker. Really. Right, right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Can we clarify who Chris is? Uh, Christopher. Chris, uh, he's the guy behind the blog oh. fixer. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next question. What's a good plugin for pop-ups to direct readers to our social media accounts, YouTube channel, mail subscription, et cetera? Casey, I think you might have mentioned one when you were referring a MailChimp and a lot of those add extra code and slow down your site. You who said that? Well, the pop-ups are really out of favor these days, honestly. And it's hard for me to even really talk about them in many cases because they are just so bad. If you're going to use a pop-up, like I said, you can use ConvertKit, you can use MailerLite, which has a pop-up, you can use um, ConvertPro, ConvertPro, MiloTree, MiloTree, ConvertPro, Convert all Pro. of them. Pro. Yeah, I would just really focus on, like, for example, Flowdesk, great tool, no exit pop-ups. So I can't recommend that as a pop-up provider. What you need to be using is something that provides you exit-only intent on your pop-up, something that is not going to activate on the first click from Google, period. I know that's confusing and troubling for a lot of people on the call, 
because a lot of people out there who do this for a living, that's what they're pushing, even though it's absolutely against Google interstitial guidelines. This isn't even in debate. It's definitely against the guidelines. You shouldn't have any pop-ups at all in the first click from Google. But if you're going to use these plugins, make sure that they're between pages, have them activate as they're navigating to other pages. And then please make sure that you're only showing the pop-up once for a person during the session. That's the most annoying thing for me is to go through a site as I'm auditing and have the same pop-up four or five times as I'm going through the site. You, the person's not coming back ever. So okay. we'll fix that and, and focus on it. We were talking about the Feast plugin earlier. One of the things that Skylar's done is he's introduced a, Sky, uh, a subscribe link mm -hmm. in the mobile header. Right. So at the top, it just says subscribe right next to your logo. So it's very prominent, but not taking mm -hmm. up much space. Click on that. It takes you to a page where you can subscribe. So you're not getting in, in people's faces, but you're still Super simple. enough. Yeah. And I think it's um, much more, you're giving a lot more respect to your visitor that way. So, um, but you're not really shooting yourself in the foot by not having an opt-in as well. Mm -hmm. Very true. And I'm going to squeeze in one last question. I know we're going over time now, but this one can be fairly quick. Um, people would like clarification on Google Tag Master. So that's the only plugin manager. on your list. Tag Manager, thank you. I read Tag Master. Tag Manager, that's the only plugin on your list that Eliza says she's not familiar with. Can you quickly explain what Google Tag Manager does as a plugin? And Arson well, brought this one up, so we should put him on the spot. We really should, but I'll, I'll let him off. It's fine. It's 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 to implement all kinds of uh, tags. Like you can put your Facebook pixel in there. You can put your analytics pixel uh, code in there. Uh, it just manages it all for you in one place. That's exactly uh, it. Again, it's a yeah. Google Tag Manager is just a way for you to interject code if you don't like code. To, for you to do things like uh, increased on-site bounce tracking for you to track uh, certain funnels if you want to set that up for you to even put in code from other plugins it allows you to just uh, have it all on one life one nice list there so that you can uh, follow it and make changes as needed I'm, I'm gonna say though for most of you listening in, listening in you don't need this mm -hmm. Um, this is a more advanced feature. Um, it's a little more complicated because once you add the Google Tag Manager script to your site, then you're adding all the other code inside the Google Tag Manager interface inside your Google account. Um, it's a, an amazing tool, but it also, like if you just need Google Analytics, just put that on your site. You don't need, you don't need to go down the Google Tag Manager road. Um, right. So don't, don't overthink it on this one. And with that, we are going to wrap it up. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and for all the questions, again, we will address all of them and send out a recap next week. Um, our big annual episode is next yeah. month. I'm gonna paste Fantastic. over in here. It's super exciting. So we're gonna do a year in review basically, mm -hmm. which we're gonna go through the most commonly asked questions in the past year and all 12 episodes that we've done and really go over uh, what you guys have been asking the most and make sure we address it again. We're also going to do some fun games and give away really good prizes. Really good prizes. Really good. Like giving away arson. Really, really good. Yes, what? like arson, maybe some one-on-one -on -one consulting time with one of these guys. I don't know, it's gonna be big. You're gonna to have to go and sign I'm up. I'm thinking Amazon gift cards, bottles of alcohol, maybe a trip to Vegas, things like that. You know, we won't oversell it, it's fine. <laughs> We might as well just say Bahamas. Smoked they meats. Anyway. A smoked meat. A nice, right. a nice a platter, smoked cured meat. Platter. A little yes. cured meat. Yes. Good times. Exactly. All that and tons more. So the link is in the chat. Make sure you guys register for that so you're aware of when we're going to start. Um, and you want to be on the registration list because everyone who registers will be entered to win. But of course, definitely attend. And thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, night, or morning, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.